All right, y'all, our objectives for this afternoon, a couple of things we're going to accomplish together. So we're going to explore the framework for the updated and redesigned 331 ELR 712 exam, which is very exciting. We'll engage with a framework crosswalk to sort of take a look at some key similarities and differences between the 231 and 331 exam. Then we'll spend some time diving deep into the constructive response component of the exam and engage with some sample candidate responses. Here is our agenda. Um, once we round out the agenda objectives review and the norms, we'll spend some time talking about some general information about the redesigned exam. Then we'll transition to the framework overview and crosswalk component. We'll take a moment to pause and reflect before transitioning into the CRI deep dive. All right, y'all. We're going to go through some general exam redesign information before we take a look at the framework crosswalk. So beginning in 2021, the 231 ELAR 712 exam began uh, redesign. So development began here a few years ago. And as you all know, stakeholder engagement throughout the redesign process. And now we are uh, approaching the launch of the redesign exam, which is very exciting. So this spring, the preparation manual became available this summer, the representative form and the interactive practice tests for the redesigned 331 exam are available. We're also here doing our framework and CRI deep dive, and then we're looking ahead to that September launch of the redesigned 331 exam. These are all um, just specific call-outs to some key dates. Again, these are on the exam one pager for you all, but did want to highlight some kind of key dates coming up. So. The prep manual, again, became available this spring. That is linked for you in your participants guide for today. Um, as of June 4th, registration is open for the redesigned 331 exam. On July 1st, again, the rep form and interactive practice test became available for the redesigned 331. And then on September 1st of this year, that is the last date to take the 231, so the older um, exam last date to take that is September 1st of 2024. So, the following day, September 2nd, our 331 redesigned exam launches. And then the last day to apply and recommend using a score on the 231 exam is September 1 of 2025. So a couple key dates. Again, these are all in that exam one pager that's linked for you if you need to go back and reference but just wanted to make sure to take a moment to call out some sort of key dates that are uh, on the horizon for us as we approach the launch of the exam. A uh, quick note here around the redesign of the exam. So 331 is not representative of a new certification area and the name of the certification area stays the same. So the exam number is transitioning from 231 to 331. With all of this exam, uh, excuse me, programs will not have to reapply to offer this certification. So we do not have a new certification area or field. We're transitioning the exam number. So if you are currently offering ELR 712, you will not need to reapply to offer this certification. Quick note on sort of high level overview in terms of the exam structure as we transition from 231 to 331. So as you all know, the 231 exam had a five hour seat time for candidates that had 100 multiple choice questions and two constructed response questions. So those literary analysis piece of the 231. As we transition to the redesigned 331 exam, a slight shift in the overall organization of that exam. So candidates will now have um, 90 selected response items. So 90 multiple choice questions some of those 90 multiple choice questions are cluster items, so multiple choice questions that build off of each other. And then candidates will be responsible for completing one constructed response item. So candidates will um, write one time on the redesigned 331 exam. Candidates will continue to have a five hour seat time for the 331 exam. So there's no change in the time that they have to complete their exam. I'm going to turn, um, turn things over to Kay to transition to our framework overview and crosswalk. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Kelly just stated, we're going to go over the framework overview and crosswalk uh, key differences. Just to name up front, we won't go over the 
entire crosswalk, but it will be available for you to review at a later date. All right, so as before we start this conversation, let's frame it with some questions to guide our thoughts as we go through this comparison kind of contrast of um, what the frameworks from 231 to 331 have shifted to. So first, what are key similarities do you notice between the 231 and updated 331 ELAR 712 frameworks? Where do you notice shifts in the organization and or content of the 331 ELAR 712 framework? And how might these shifts impact our program's preparation of ELAR candidates? And finally, what other questions do you have about the updated 331 712 framework? Okay, so this is just a sample um, of what the framework looks like. You'll see the entire 331 there with the comparison to 231. Um, as you can see in the second column here, there are X's to indicate where there was uh, similar language or consistent uh, content ideas across both frameworks. And where there is no X, those are some shifts that were made and updated in the 331 framework. All right, and just to also help us as we go through um, the framework, of course, is separated into three compartments. So there's like a domain that has like very broad ideas of what uh, the standards or TEKS that will be covered or the things that educators should do. And then there's a competency that really kind of narrows it and really kind of zero in on what each candidate should do in e within each of those domains. And then you have a descriptive statement, which basically explains how the teacher will demonstrate their understanding of these competencies. So it goes from the overarching to specific and then to the actual examples to demonstrate how the competencies will be demonstrated in practice. All right, so initially when you look at the framework, you'll see that there were four domains and 11 competencies, and now 331 has shifted to five domains and 12 competencies. And we'll get into a little bit more of what those look like as we go through the overview. All right, so the first key is domain one was reading instruction and assessment. Domain two, text comprehension and analysis. Domain three, oral and written communication. Domain four, educating all learners and professional practice. And then domain five is the constructive response. All right, so we're gonna go through domain one which includes the first three competencies. So competency one, competency two, and competency three, which are the foundations of reading inst instruction and assessment, vocabulary development, and also reading comprehension. So when you look through the deck, if you go through this after the webinar, you'll see that the initial uh, comp one from 231 was really focused on emphasizing the interconnectedness of reading, listening, speaking, writing and thinking, and as the framework shifted, you see that there is an inclusion of research-based evidence uh, practices, distinguishing characteristics of dyslexia and dysgraphia, and really the shared responsibility of promoting English language development among English learners, and also building background knowledge skills to help students master complex text and academic vocabulary. So with uh, competency two, this overarching idea was that teachers understood and taught um, the relationships among words to, to develop vocabulary skills. And that shifted, of course, to include knowledge of research-based evidence and practices, and also including how students' backgrounds impact uh, how they learn and also those cross-curriculum strategies to promote vocabulary development. So again, moving from just the knowledge of and demonstrating to actually understanding the origins of things and how students learn. All right, and for competency three, um, the key was to understand and promote reading as an active process. So that meant using metacognition, assessment, and instructional strategies to develop students' reading comprehension skills. But as it shifted to 331, now there's, of course, a focus on using research-based and evidence-based strategies, but also emphasizing how those complex text critical thinking and higher order cognition skills help students to develop and promote uh, the reading process and also how they process what they're reading. 
All right, moving on to domain two, text comprehension and analysis. Okay, so competency four and five are in domain two. Competency four, of course, is reading literary text. And competency five is reading informational text and argumentative text. So the overarching idea from competency four was understanding different types of texts, how they're organized, um, analyzing them as far as the genre and characters and how all these things play into um, what a student can grasp from their understanding after reading the text. And as it shifted, of course, there's emphasis on research-based and evidence-based strategies, but also emphasizing how the uh, characterization or all these devices work together to convey purpose, meaning, and theme. So again, zeroing in on low skills. All right, in competency five and 231, the emphasis was to demonstrate knowledge of skills for comprehending non-literary text and demonstrating knowledge of types of text structure, knowing how to evaluate the credibility of a source and the accuracy of information. And so key shifts in 331 were, of course, promoting research-based strategies and best practices to help promote comprehension among uh, students and also to increase the emphasis on analyzing and being able to understand informational text and argumentative text using rhetorical devices and then characteristics and structures of elements of argumentative text. And lastly, analyzing the author's purpose and audience and message within complex informational and argumentative texts. All righty, so domain three, oral and written communication. So that includes competency six, which is composition, competency seven, inquiry and research, and then competency eight, listening and speaking. And so in 231, the emphasis was to apply uh, skills and strategies for writing effectively in a variety of forms and for a variety of audiences and purposes and context. And so, of course, we have the inclusion and in shifts, I'm sorry, in 331 with the inclusion of research-based and uh, strategies and best practices for using the continuum of writing development as described in the TEKS, but also using strategies and be best practices for assessing students' writing development. And there was also an emphasis on not just the instructor doing this or the educator doing this, but students being able to do that themselves for their work and their peers' work. You'll see that once you uh, go into the framework or either their crosswalk. And also lastly, using assessment data to inform future instruction in writing, which is also a common thing you'll see within 331. There's an emphasis on how and what to do for the processes and things that happen in class after an assessment has gone on. So the emphasis of how an instructor is gonna use that data to help students. Alrighty, in competency seven for 231, uh, this was, the focus was on engaging in inquiry and research pro and providing students with learning experiences to promote that knowledge. And then the shifts for 331 include of course, our friend, research-based strategies and best practices for promoting students' ability to and identify and analyze various types of logical fallacies, but also strategies and best practices for using the continuum of development of inquiry and research. So again, if you haven't noticed, the key shift is really focusing on how students are going to use these uh, and actively use them. So giving them that space to be accountable for their learning and their work. So for competency eight, the key focus in 231 was to understand how students' background and diversity are important to student learning. And then, of course, we're doing that now in 331 with the scope and lens of research-based strategies and best practices when we do those things. Uh, so we'll see further into the framework with the universal components where we see this really emphasized. All righty, so domain four, educating all learners in professional practice. Uh, so competency nine is differentiation strategies and planning and practice. Competency 10 is culture responsive practices. Competency 11, data-driven practice and formal and informal assessments. Um, and here in this particular domain, it's important because this was added to all of the new um, exams as far as identifying and implementation of strategies and practices to, to support all students. This is where you see the UDL being incorporated and really supporting students who have different disabilities or who uh, may even be emergent bilingual students 
pretty much all students to make sure that they are getting what they need in class. And then also developmentally appropriate assessment practices and the application of ELAR specific knowledge and skills. Alrighty, so the last domain is domain five, the constructor response, and this is the competency 12. So the framework to, with the new redesign, we've also shifted how uh, the exam will be scored as far as the percentages. So if you see domain one will serve as 25%, domain two, 17%, three, 25, uh, four, 13, and five, the constructor response, 20%. Alrighty, so as we talk in our groups too, we want you to consider what are some priorities you can see in having the exam weighted this way? Um, what does this mean for candidates and where can you see these differences or shifted priorities from the previous exam? Alrighty, so uh, just based on the information that I went over, what key similarities do you notice between 231 and the updated 331 ELAR 712 frameworks? Where do you notice the shifts in organization and or content of the 331 ELAR 712 framework? How might these shifts impact your program's preparation for ELAR candidates? And lastly, what other questions do you have about the updated 331 ELAR 712 framework? All right, so at this time, I'm going to hand it over to DeMarco, who's going to go over the CRI component of the exam. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and dive into um, a conversation and review of the constructed response item. Some things to note about the constructed response item. This is truly an opportunity for candidates to demonstrate their subject specific knowledge, skills, concepts, and best practices. Um, in a second, I'll talk about how this CRI is different from the, the current exam, the 231, and why those differences are important for our candidates. Um, the ask for candidates is to write approximately 400 to 600 words as their response. Um, and as Kay shared, this is 20% of the overall exam score, with the emphasis being on an opportunity for candidates to demonstrate their subject, demonstrate their knowledge of ELAR pedagogy. The current exam, so ELAR 231, has two CRIs. One of them is dedicated to a literary analysis where candidates are asked to um, read two thematically related passages, identify shared themes between those passages, and then analyze literary devices and techniques. Um, so essentially, this is a grown-up version of the AP exam, if you will. Um, and the other portion or the other CRI within 231 is a sample writing assessment uh, in pedagogy. So candidates are asked to read a student response to in-class writing, and then they have three tasks to complete. Um, within this second CRI. So they are asked to identify one strength that they notice within this, can this student's writing sample, one weakness, and then one instructional activity to address that weakness. Um, as I shared, the 331, the new exam that launches in September, is a little different from our current CRI. To start, there's only one CRI, and this CRI is uh, it's formed around cl a classroom lesson exhibit analysis. Uh, so within the CRI, there are actually three exhibits. The first exhibit is going to be a learning objective and excerpt for the candidate to read through. This will include um, a TEKS strand, a learning objective for the candidate to read, and then also a literary excerpt for the candidate to read through that's connected to the TEK strand and the learning objective. Um, with really the idea being here to have the candidate to think about what is the focus of instruction. The second exhibit within the CRI will be a student assignment. It will have success criteria for that assignment and a student written response. Um, so the student in this classroom scenario is asked to produce an in-class writing assignment, which is similar to um, what candidates would see in the 231, excuse me, CRI, um, where candidates are having to think about what are students supposed to do? Remember in exhibit one, they just read through the TEKS, the learning objective and the literary excerpt. And so now in, in exhibit two, they're thinking about what are students supposed to do? And then they also have to think about what does success look like with this assignment? 
The third exhibit that a candidate will interact with within the CRI is the student teacher discussion. Within this conversation between a teacher and a student, um, really this is an opportunity for the candidate to recognize ways to support student success. Um, these conversations aren't going to be in a perfect world. They're going to be, excuse me, different parts of the conversation um, where a candidate can pick out something that the student might need to work on um, because that's gonna be critical to the success within this CRI. Um, but ultimately the goal with this CRI is to place the candidate in a classroom setting so that they're able to think through a scenario that they very likely would experience in their own classrooms, right? So our ELAR teachers are having to think through TEAK strands. They are having to think through whether or not the learning objective is aligned to the TEAKs. And then the texts that they are using are also aligned to the TEAKs and the learning objective. And what is the focus of instruction here? So all of the different pieces that a candidate experience within um, the redesigned ELAR 331 exam CRI, excuse me, they should represent something that the candidate would actually have to experience as they uh, move throughout their teaching career. Another thing I wanna call out here are the performance characteristics between the two exams. So when we're thinking about the performance characteristics, this is really um, what the candidate is being measured on, what will inform the rubric for the candidate. On the previous exam, our candidates are being, uh, the performance characteristics included purpose to the extent to which the candidate responds to the components of the question, um, demonstration of knowledge, how knowledgeable are they of the themes and the different literary devices that they're being asked to evaluate there, um, how do they support their responses, what rationale do they provide, and then their written expression. So those were the five different performance characteristics on the old exam. The new exam now features three different performance characteristics. Um, so one, completion. This is really thinking about to what degree, uh, to the degree which the candidate completes the assignment by responding to each specific task in the assignment. So in a second, we're gonna walk through what are the five different asks a candidate will need to think through in order to successfully complete the CRI. The second performance characteristic here is the application of content. So the degree to which the candidate applies relevant knowledge and skills to the response accurately and effectively. So if the candidate has a CRI that has a TEAK related to utilizing literary devices, then I think it's a, a, a pretty fair expectation that that candidate is addressing this CRI by um, applying their knowledge of literary devices to support a student in that context, right? So we wouldn't be looking at a, a, a candidate wouldn't provide, or shouldn't, I should say, provide a response um, that's related to vocabulary when really the TEAK is focused on getting the, the student's uh, success related to literary devices. And then lastly, the last performance characteristic on this new exam uh, CRI would be support. The degree to the degree to which the candidate supports their response with the appropriate evidence, examples, and explanations based on the relevant content, knowledge, and skills. Um, so really, again, our candidates are being thrown into a classroom scenario and having to utilize ELAR pedagogy. Yes, it will be important for them to think through um, analyzing the literary text as part of exhibit one, but it's even more important for them to think through how to support student analysis of the literary text. Um, so part of the uh, this conversation, we thought it's important to share with you the breakdown of um, the scale score. So when we're looking at the rubric, what are we considering a four, a three, a two, and a one? So when we think about our four responses, um, this reflects a thorough understanding of the relevant content, knowledge, and skills. And you're like, okay, well, what does is, what is relevant content, knowledge, and skills mean? This response would fully address all parts of the assignment. So again, in a second, we'll walk through the five different tasks that are associated with this CRI assignment. Has the candidate fully addressed all five of those tasks? The response demonstrates an accurate, highly effective application of the relevant content knowledge and skills. So if a candidate suggests an instructional activity, is this actually something that connects to the learning objective, uh, connects to the TEKS? Like, is it something that is plausible with this lesson that the candidate is asked 
uh, to analyze in this moment. And then lastly, a four response would provide strong, relevant evidence, specific examples, and well-reasoned explanations. Now, we, are, we all enjoy ELAR, so we know that when you provide an answer, you have to explain it, just like in math, right? But with evidence in ELAR. So it's not enough to say, you know, if I'm teaching my classroom, my, my kids can never provide, hey, Mr. Petrie, this is, the theme is walking through park, through the park gives you nightmares. Okay, that's a great statement. It sounds very strong, but what gave you that idea? That is the theme of the passage we are reading. Where did you get this notion from? I need evidence to back that up. So a four response would have that evidence as to why the candidate is suggesting the instructional activity or thinking or suggesting the uh, assessment assignment that they're going to use to support this kid through their literary analysis. A three response, just a degree lower than a four. This, this response addresses most or all parts of the assignment. It demonstrates a generally accurate, effective application of the relevant content, knowledge, and skills, um, and it provides sufficient evidence, some examples, and generally sound explanations. So our, our folks who are getting threes are almost at the, the four bar, but they might be missing some components in their response. And then a two response. Um, a two response addresses at least some parts of the assignment, not all, not most, some of them um, demonstrates a partially accurate, partially effective application of the relevant content, knowledge, and skills, and the response provides limited uh, evidence and examples or explanations, okay? So we're really limiting ourselves within this two range here. And then there are some additional scores that a candidate can receive, a one, um, and, and a one really is when a candidate addresses few, if any, parts of the assignment um, and demonstrates a large, largely inaccurate, right? So if a candidate, again, if the TEAK is fo focused on literary devices and a candidate suggests playing basketball as an instructional activity uh, that's not necessarily connected to the TEAK or the learning objective, um, then this that might fall in the one territory because that might not be, depending on the context, of course, that might not be an accurate um, an accurate demonstration of knowledge and relevant content knowledge and skills. A candidate could also get a score, receive a score of U, which means the response is unscorable because it is unreadable, uh, not written on the assigned topic, written in a language other than English, or does not contain sufficient amount of original work to score. So we want to steer away, steer our candidates away from getting a U, a one, and then this last one, a B. Um, there's no response to the assignment. The ELAR 712 CRI charge. What are we asking our candidates to do within this assessment? Um, so when a candidate experiences their CRI, they are going to read through this particular charge. Um, so when a candidate experiences their CRI, they're going to be asked to analyze the information provided in the exhibits and citing specific evidence from the exhibits, write a response of approximately 400 to 600 words, and they will have to address the following. So there are five different um, tasks, if you will, that a candidate will have to address. First, they will have to describe one strategy that they would use to help the student connect prior knowledge and real, real world experiences to the new content. Um, so assum an assumption here is that when a candidate does experience a CRI, then there's going to be some gap uh, or some area where a candidate can actually push the student to connect prior knowledge to uh, the lesson that they are receiving. Another task here is that the candidate will be asked to describe one area of academic need that the student demonstrates related to English language arts, reading, or the learning objective. So again, the candidate is scanning for gaps in instruction within the CRI. They'll also be asked to describe one developmentally appropriate instructional strategy that would be used to address the identified need. So because this is an ELAR 712 certification exam, it's important that our candidates are familiar with strategies that are developmentally appropriate for the kids that they will instruct. That's critical. Um, and then lastly, explain how you would use data from this assessment method 
to measure the student's progress and plan for future instruction. So really we're pushing our candidates here to think about the future. If you are providing this assignment, how are we going to use the data you gain from this assignment, uh, excuse me, this assignment to instruct students in the future? How are we going to use this data to support our students further? Because everything is about supporting our students, right? So we don't wanna give assessments that aren't necessarily meaning in that, in that support, that aren't aligned to the TEKS and the learning objective. Um, okay, and as I shared a little earlier, there are three exhibits, right? So exhibit one, the learning objective and the TEK um, will provide grade level and specific ELAR TEKS a candidate will utilize in their written response. So because this is a 712 exam, then you can expect a range of TEKS that a candidate could interact with. Um, in exhibit two, this is the student assignment, success criteria, and the student written response. This provides uh, a detail of success criteria. So if there's an assignment measured, the candidate will review success criteria on what would make this um, a, a student successful with this criteria so that they're able to evaluate the student in task writing and response and identify uh, any gaps in student understanding and how to support this student. And then lastly, the final exhibit again is the student teacher discussion. Um, this provides additional details around potential student misunderstanding, right? As we all know, you can read a student's response and think, hey, this is, at, this is the gap that they're having. This is why they're struggling with this particular skill. But really, it's not until we talk to kids and we find out and we have, a, you know, we push their thinking and we question them. That's where we find out where the trouble might happen, where the misunderstanding occurred. Um, so again, candidates are going to read through a discussion between a teacher and student and see if they can um, investigate further into what might be best to support the student in achieving the learning objective. Okay, and here are those charges again. So just to recap, they need to describe one strategy, one area of academic need, <clears throat> excuse me, of academic strength, one developmentally appropriate uh, instructional strategy, one developmentally appropriate method of assessment, and then lastly, how would they use that, ass that assessment data? Now, we, I, we thought it might be helpful for you to take a look at what the actual exhibits are. These are present within the prep preparation manual that's linked in your participant's guide. Um, but just to give you an example, exhibit one, as I shared, has a learning objective, but we'll begin with the TEK at the top, and then a candidate is able to read down and see how that learning objective um, becomes almost a strand of that TEK or is derived from that TEK. From there, the candidate will then read uh, a text that is aligned to both the TEK and the learning objective. So while we're not asking the candidate outright uh, to provide some sort of literary analysis similar to what they would do in the 231 exam, um, I think it's just understood that our candidates will have to analyze this text in order to uh, push student thinking. So really the shift from 231 to 331 is how do you take your understanding of this text and support student understanding of the text? Because that is going to be critical. And then in exhibit two, which is the student assignment success criteria, you see here, um, the candidate is provided with the assignment and then they are provided with success criteria for that assignment. Um, and then you see the student response to the assignment as well. Um, a student teacher discussion. So there's teacher and there's student, and then they have a lovely conversation um, where a candidate should be able to glean some sort of information as to how to best support this student. Um, so now I promised you some additional fun here. On your participants guide, you actually have a sample CRI response. Um, I'm going to give you about two minutes to speed read uh, through this example CRI response. Um, and I would love for you to think about the questions that you see in the blue box here on the screen. Where do you see evidence of the candidate's understanding of ELAR related knowledge skills and or related co concepts? So really we're wondering, where do you see evidence that this person understands how to teach ELAR <laughs> concepts in this classroom? Secondly, does this response answer each component of the CRI charge in full? So think about those five things, right? Where's the strategy? Where's the one area of academic need? Does the candidate list those things? 
Where's the developmentally appropriate strategy to address the need? Um, where's the appropriate method of assessment? And then how would you, how would this candidate use the data? We're looking for all five of those things to be present in this response. And then lastly, does the sample response contain accurate evidence or examples to support their instructional strategy? We are ELAR folks. If you said it, you need to support it. Um, so we're looking for that presence within the CRI response as well. Um, so I will set my timer for two minutes and then I will move forward. Okay, that was a very quick two minutes, uh, but something that I want you to keep at the top of your mind as I, I walk through this example CRI is that it does identify the CRI as a strong response. So something that we should consider is what makes this a strong response? Why is it strong? Um, so to start, when we're thinking about our strong responses, remember, it is important that the candidate addresses those five different asks that are outlined in the prompt of the CRI, with the first one being describing one strategy that you would use to help the student connect prior knowledge and real world experiences to the new content and contexts in the excerpt provided. Now, I... I want to point out here that when we're thinking about, again, what makes a strong response, how we're connecting it to this one strategy that would help the student connect to prior knowledge. To help, when we look at this response, the very first sentence honestly identifies this candidate's thinking around that first task. Uh, this candidate writes, to help connect all students' prior knowledge uh, and experience to the text, I would begin by, and then they outline what they would have their student do here. I would begin by having the student write an in-class journal entry to enhance um, an empathetic connection to Ren. Now, this is an ELAR class. So an in-journal, an in-class journal, yes, that sounds like an appropriate activity um, to enhance or to activate this prior knowledge and connect it to the new learning. Um, so we would give a check here. This candidate is describing a strategy that would uh, they could use to help the student connect prior knowledge and real world experiences. <clears throat> and not to mention building, building empathy for the character we know is a, a, a very strong entryway into text analysis as well. The second part here that we need to make sure that a candidate hits and, I, and this particular response does really, really well is describing one area of academic need that the student demonstrates related to ELAR. Um, so when you're looking at this response, this candidate says explicitly an area of their academic need is using textual evidence to support a claim about a character. Um, the student's strongest paragraph and then the, the sentences that follow actually explain why the candidate thinks that this is the area of academic need. The student's strongest paragraph correctly connects Ren, being a little worried, um, to seeming to be in charge at home. However, the student must be prompted to get to the idea of Ren being a loner. Now, the assumption here is that the candidate uh, got this information from the conversation between the teacher and the student. So again, exhibit three is meant to support what the candidate is reading in the student in writing task. And then lastly, um, the candidate notes that this is superficially correct. So yes, what the student share with the teacher is not incorrect, um, but there is an area to push student thinking here. And the candidate outlines where that area is and how they might go about doing that. Um, and that's something that we want to think, we want to have our candidates think through as they're interacting with the CRI. The next part of this response that makes it strong is how the candidate actually describes one developmentally appropriate instructional strategy they would use to identify the students, uh, excuse me, use to address the students identified need. Um, and then also they have to support why they would use this instructional strategy. Um, at the very top here, you see it. The use of a graphic organizer would be one way to help the student make more direct connections between inferences and textual evidence. Now, one thing I do want to share is we don't want our candidates just to say, 
use a graphic organizer end of story because graphic organizers are helpful in a lot of different ways. But we do need to make sure that the candidate is explaining how this particular graphic organizer will be helpful for the task that the student has been assigned. Right, We don't want a random graphic organizer that isn't aligned to the TEKS, that isn't aligned to the learning objective, that actually doesn't take the student from point A in understanding to point succeed in understanding. Right, um, And the candidate here does mention that this would be a making inferences organizer. And then they describe, divided into two columns, would allow the student to work in both directions, listening to details on one side of the organizer and drawing inferences from those details. Um, again, as I shared earlier, one of the main goals of this CRI is to really have candidates thinking about something that they would do in their classrooms, right? They would have to strategically think about how to make this graphic organizer applicable to the lesson. Um, and so that is what makes this a pretty strong response is that the candidate is doing that. They are making this graphic organizer specific to the task for this student and the student's need. And then the last two um, asks within the CRI prompt would be to describe one developmentally appropriate method of assessment and then explain how you would use data from that assessment to measure the student's progress. Um, so yes, it's great. We want to support our, our kiddos in the classroom and learning, but we should also think about how are we going to assess what we just supported them with? How are we going to know that they really understand this skill and we should be thinking in the future of how to support them? Um, so for this particular candidate, they list that they would assess the student's progress through monitoring the completion of the graphic organizer um, work as the student progressed through the texts, and then also having side-by-side -side discussions with the student to give the teacher, um, the candidate, the opportunity to question the student and connections between the textual evidence and the inferences listed in the organizer. So this particular candidate is planning for check-ins with the student. They're planning to have these side-by-side -side, uh, conversations with the student. Now, uh, this is just one example. This candidate also could have shared, I'm going to have, you know, a quick turn and talk and I'm going to skate around the room and listen to what the conversations are. Or I'm going to have students share an inference on a whiteboard and hold it up or on a piece of paper and hold it up and I'm going to scan my check for understanding that way. Um, but the, I guess what I'm drilling down here is that this particular candidate is planning for the check for understanding. They're planning for this assessment. And then they also indicate how they would use this data to measure the student's progress. Um, so really thinking about through the questioning sessions with that student, they would gather notes that would indicate what would these notes do? Indicate whether progress was being made. Um, so really, again, we're looking for the candidate to explain their decision making. Um, they have all the toolkits that their programs are providing them. I mean, the tools in their toolkits. And so the goal of the CRI is to have them apply those tools and explain to uh, explain within the context of the CRI why those are the appropriate tools given the task. So in summary, um, this particular candidate presents a thorough understanding of the relevant content, knowledge, and skills, um, has a response that includes and addresses all parts of the assignment. So those five different asks that we discussed a little earlier um, and the response to each part is fully developed with evidence, examples, and explanations. Um, the candidate also accurately and effectively applies concepts and terminology relevant to the English language arts. Um, so the instructional strategies that this candidate suggests within the content, context of the CRI um, are appropriate for the context of the CRI. Um, and then lastly, this response does provide an assessment of the student's skill level um, that is grounded in evidence from the exhibits, right? Because those ex exhibits are there to help support the candidate's response. Okay, y'all. So I'm going to pause again from my speaking and give you an opportunity to take a look at what has been identified as a weak response. Similar questions here. Where do you see evidence of the candidate's understanding of ELAR related knowledge, skills, and our related concepts? Um, thinking about does this response answer each component of the CRI charge in full? Excuse me. 
does the sample response contain accurate evidence or examples to support their instructional strategy? So really the tagline question that we should have at the top of our minds is why is this considered a weak response? Um, I'm going to give you two minutes to review that response, which is on your note catcher, um, and then we'll come back and walk through it together. Okay, so let's take a look at what exactly makes this uh, a classified weak response. Now, when we look at, again, we're going back to our charge here for the candidate, and that charge um, is to describe one strategy. Remember, describe one strategy that you would use to help students connect prior knowledge and real world experiences, describe one area of academic need related to ELAR, describe one developmentally appropriate strategy to address that need, and then well, how are you going to assess? And then how would you use the data from that assessment? So when we think about the very first charge, which is around connecting prior knowledge, uh, this particular candidate says they, they would ask students to think about a time they visited a graveyard and how that made them feel. Now, okay. Um, now what's interesting is, yes, that thinking about a time that you were in a graveyard is an opportunity to connect to prior knowledge. That's not completely inaccurate. Um, but when we think about what's actually happening in this, um, what's happening in this text and what's actually the student's gap here, we do wanna push the thinking here a little more, right? So it's not enough to say, I want them to think about a time they were in a graveyard and how that made them feel. Um, and then also we're looking for an explanation of how this is relevant to what the character in the excerpt is feeling. So one way to push this response is, okay, I want them to think about a time that they were in a graveyard and how that made them feel. Here's how it applies to the lesson that's being presented within this exhibit. Remember the next charge here is describing an area of academic need. So for this particular candidate, um, they list the area of academic need as the student needing to know more vocabulary so that they can use details for better inferences. Um, but again, this isn't, you know, yes, students definitely need to know more vocabulary. Um, and the candidate here even goes into explaining, for instance, the student clearly did, did not know um, cantref means but used it anyway, which is not really appropriate as a teacher said. So using the context from the conversation between teacher and student um, and the candidate discusses um, the purpose of context clues and how that can help in inference making. Um, so again, this isn't completely wrong, um, but we do need to think about, are there some more relevant skills that the student needs to develop to access the learning objective in this example? Again, go back to that strong example um, and thinking about how that particular candidate identified the student need there and then was able to develop an instructional strategy to develop to um, further support the student need. And then we go on, the candidate goes on to explain uh, another line or two around developing voc teaching and developing vocabulary and how they would do this with the entire class to make sure they all understood the vocabulary. Um, and then some targeted questions that the candidate would ask the, the class. They go on to share that they would have students keep a list of all the words and phrases that they didn't know while reading. Um, and so what we wanna think about here is that while enhancing vocabulary development is an important skill, um, that is recognized in the TEKS, is it actually the student's most relevant academic need within the context of drawing inferences? Um, and then also asking students to create short narratives from newly learned vocabulary, does that explicitly support the learning objective of using textual evidence to make inferences? So again, we're looking at the difference between a strong response and a weak response here. Is this instructional strategy the best move possible for this particular student? This is something the candidate has to think through throughout the entire exam. Um, we're not saying necessarily that the instructional strategy is a bad strategy, but does this strategy apply to this particular context in this particular scenario? And then lastly, we do wanna think through, uh, there are two more 
kind of charges here for the candidate to think through. And this one is around the assessment. Um, one developmentally appropriate assessment this candidate is listing <clears throat> is increasing vocabulary would be the ex exit tickets at the end of class readings. Now, I do want to say exit tickets are an excellent type of assessment for students. That is an opportunity for us to capture data at the end of class. Now, but again, we're thinking about the difference between a weak response and a strong response. What can we, what is the best leverage tool that this teacher can use to support student understanding now? In the strong response, this teacher said, hey, I'm going to introduce a graphic organizer that allows for the student to think in both directions that will further enhance their thinking around making inferences with this particular text. I'm doing this before we even get to the, I might be doing this before we even get to the exit slip, or hey, I might utilize this graphic organizer in a reteach lesson the next day to ensure that my student or my group of students is achieving this particular learning objective. Um, so again, the candidate is given that T, they're given that learning objective, and we're looking for the best leverage strategies to support that learning objective, given the provided evidence within the exhibits. To sum it all up, uh, this particular candidate has limited application of accurate, relevant, effective professional knowledge for teaching ELAR. So there are some places where, yes, these strategies um, are appropriate ELAR strategies, but are they appropriate for this context and for this particular learning objective? They have limited demonstration of ELAR pedagogy, um, provide minimal evidence and explanation in some places, and I would add the word relevant here. They, while they provided explanation, um, the kind of explanation that they had, was it actually relevant, again, to supporting that learning objective? And then lastly here, description of the method of assessment and use of the data is limited as well. Um, so yes, this candidate identified the use of exit tickets, but thinking about the future, what can we do with this data? How is this going to be useful? How is this going to support the objective right now? So some questions that I do want you to take uh, about 30 seconds to reflect on. Why is it important to answer each specific task within the constructor response item? Where do you anticipate candidates may or may not provide a complete response? Where do you see evidence of candidate application of relevant knowledge and skills within the strong response example? Again, this is an example that you can find within the preparation materials. Um, so please use that as an anchor. How might you support candidates to apply their learning within a constructed response item? And then lastly, how can you support candidates to leverage appropriate evidence, examples, and explanations within their constructed response? I'll give y'all just a couple seconds to reflect on this. Yeah.